All right. Good day. This is Professor Resnick again, and I want to introduce you all to Marx's famous book, Capital. So let me begin um, in the first volume of Capital, which I've asked you to, to read. Marx begins by discussing the relationship between uh, different kinds of uh, commodities. There um, he discusses, as you will read, um, one coat equals 20 yards of linen. Let me put that on the whiteboard here. One coat equals 20 yards of linen. Okay. There are three um, aspects of this uh, relationship that I want to uh, focus on following the logic of Marx. First, as a use value, and remember what a commodity is, it has a use value, has an exchange value, that is it's produced for exchange and it's produced by concrete labor. As a use value, um, each of these commodities has a unique characteristic, a unique qualitative characteristic associated with it, which is of importance to the buyer. Um, so the uh, linen has a uh, linenness, I'm not sure exactly what that is. The coat has coatness. That's a relationship between the buyer and a commodity. So it's something unique. It's something that gives pleasure, um, satisfaction, whatever words you want, to the buyer of the commodity. In other words, there's a demand for that commodity. It has a use value to the, to the buyer. So let me put another one on to make this clear. Uh, this is one that Marx uses, but let me put this on. Uh, uh, you know, 40,000 toothbrushes is equal to one Mercedes-Benz. A little bit more dramatic than Marx's example. So here, um, a Mercedes has the driving capacity of, of an automobile, a Mercedes, to give people pleasure when they buy it. By the same logic, a toothbrush has toothbrush capacity, whatever that means, th that gives pleasure, utility, to the person who buys the uh, uh, toothbrush. Okay. Second, so each of these commodities has a use value, and notice these use values are different, they're not the same. Second, as an exchange value, these different things, these different entities, have a relationship with one another. They're exchanged in a certain uh, proportion. Okay. And third, um, don't forget now, each of these is produced by concrete labor. That is, uh, coat-making labor produces the unique and interesting characteristics of a coat, those use values associated with a coat. By the same logic, the linen maker produces the uh, interesting and useful and unique characteristics of a linen, and by the same logic, we do it. Uh, the concrete labor of Mercedes-Benz labor produces the driving capacity of a car. The concrete labor of toothbrush labor produces the the uh, specific qualities of a toothbrush. So each commodity is a product of concrete labor, a specific kind of labor associated with that commodity that produces its unique and interesting features to the buyers of the commodity in society. Next, now, okay, having defined this, Marx comes back and asks, why are these different things the same in a certain proportion? When, when you confront the world of exchange out there, economists, before Marx and after Marx, ask the question, a common question, why are these different things the same and why in this proportion? I mean, after all, it, it, you can't drive a toothbrush drive down the road and you can't brush your teeth with a Mercedes. So it, it's silly. So you have to ask then, why are these different things the same and why in some proportion? Well, Marx begins. He, he argues that what makes a coat equal to linen and what makes linen equal to a coat and what makes, a, in my example, toothbrush equal to a Mercedes and what a, makes a Mercedes equal to a toothbrush can't be the unique characteristics of each of them. Why? Because they're unique. They're different. So you can't use that which is different as an argument for why these things are the same. Okay, so something is going on here to make them the same, but it's not the you know, use value of each of them. Marx makes an argument that you can't see, you can't 
conceive of why these different things are the same by looking at the equation, by thinking about the equation itself. In other words, that which is ma making them the same is not present in this. It's missing. So Marx has to provide a theorization, an explanation of what is this missing property that makes these different things the same in some proportion. A theory of that missing property. He calls the missing property value. So he's pre presenting a theorization, a theory of value, that missing property, which makes these different things the same in a certain proportion. Now, just as a footnote to this. That's the Marxian theory of value. There are non-Marxian, or at least I only know one other, non-Marxian theory of value that makes these different things the same. That's called neoclassical economic theory. But that's a different course. We are staying with the Marxian theory of this uh, missing property. And he presents that in Capital, uh, Volume 1. And that's one of the reasons we're reading it. OK, next step. In exchange, a seller of the commodity the seller of the commodity, that person that's selling toothbrushes or selling Mercedes or selling coats or selling linen, okay, is getting rid of the use value of the commodity. In fact, the seller of the commodity is alienating that use value, separating it to the buyer. The seller has no interest in the use value of the commodity. That's another way of t uh, discussing what production for exchange means. When, when, when General Motors, Ford, and so forth, when they produce cars for exchange, they're getting rid of the use value of that commodity as sellers. And the use value is only of interest to the buyer, because the buyer is buying it for use and getting its you know, driving capacity, toothbrush capacity, or whatever. Okay, so. The moment of exchange is the same moment for any seller when, when there is a separation, a dichotomy between the use and exchange value of a commodity. And once again, the, the seller only has interest in that use value of the commodity insofar as it is of interest to the buyer. Okay? Then, you know, that's one of the reasons for advertising, to stimulate a use value. That is a reason for advertising on the part of the seller, to stimulate use value so that the buyer would per will purchase that commodity. So the buyer, of course, is interested in the use value of the commodity because he or she is going to consume it for whatever pleasure that uh, gives to the, to the buyer. So that the, the relationship of the buyer to the commodity is one of a private relationship, whereas the relationship of the seller of commodity is, is, is a social relationship because he, she is only interested in the exchange value, that which is common to all commodities, and is alienating this private feature. The seller is, no, as I said again, is not interested in the use value. So wh wh why belabor this? Well, this turns out, this, this separation between the use and exchange value of the commodity turns out to be crucial to understand Marx's theory of the origins of surplus value or, as we've done so far in the course, the origins of class exploitation. That's its importance. You see, in capitalism, workers will sell something that they own, which is their labor power. So labor power, which means the capacity of a person to work, the capacity, the power of a person to work, to use up his, her muscle and brain tissue in the job, the capacity to sell that to a, a buyer, to a capitalist, Okay, labor power is a commodity. When, a, a, when workers sell that commodity, following this logic now, they receive its value in exchange, the wage, but what they alienate, what they get rid of, is the use value of that particular commodity. Just like if it were a person who's producing and selling an orange, the, the buyer of the orange gets its use value. Well, in a parallel way, the buyer of the commodity uh, labor power, which is the capitalist, gets its use value. And here's, here's the, mo the uh, I don't want to say trick, but here's this breakthrough of Marx. The use value of labor power, that singular commodity, the use value of labor power, has the potential to create more value in production for the buyer than it costs the buyer in exchange in the market. So this is a... Uh, 
this is a, a, a kind of golden goose here, this commodity labor power, because of this aspect of it, which is that if you're a buyer, you get, you get, you get something that's use value, which has the capacity to create more in value than what it costs you to, to acquire it. You, if there is a, a, an excess, you get it as the buyer. Hence, Marxian theory, in a sense, Marxian theory, or Marxian value theory, is a way for the workers to understand what it is they're getting rid of. It teaches them, if they struggle with it, it teaches them that what they're getting rid of is this wonderful golden egg, okay? Which the, the use value is going to the buyer, and that's not, they're, that's, they're not the buyers in capitalism. It's going to, to the buyers who are the capitalists. So it teaches them what they have lost in capitalism, but it also gives them another kind of incentive. They can begin to, to, to ask themselves, individually and collectively, why can't they be in the position to buy their own labor power? And if that were the case, if they were in the position not only to sell as, as a collectivity, but also as a collectivity, collectivity to be in the position to buy their labor power, they would then acquire its use value this, this golden egg. Well, when workers are in that position, not only to sell their labor power to themselves, but also to acquire the use value of labor power to themselves, that's called communism. So Marx is providing a, a theory, this, this interesting economic theory, which he thinks may be able to liberate workers give them a freedom from class exploitation and put them in the position in which they can get the use value and hence the surplus of their own labor power. Let me return then to, this, to, to these exchanges. Okay? What makes a coat equal to linen, what makes a Mercedes equal to a, a toothbrush can't be the different use values of each, you know, as I said, because those use values are, are different. Indeed, the seller is alienating the, the use value of the commodity in order to, uh, in order to get rid of it, okay? So step one is what makes C equal to L, what makes toothbrushes equal to Mercedes can't be these different use values, okay? Indeed, in order to have exchange to begin with, you have to have different use values. In your readings, you'll notice Marx continually says that. The things have to be different, have to have different use values in order to have exchange. Otherwise, you'll have lit, coat for coat, linen for linen. That's not interesting. So the moment, so you need different use values. Then the moment there is exchange, then you're alienating, you're separating the use value for each of the sellers. Okay, it's the buyers that are getting the use value. Step two, okay. These different use values are a product of concrete labor. If you recall, that's how we started. That is, the unique qualities of coat and linen and toothbrushes and, and uh, Mercedes and all the other commodities you can think of are a complex product of the specific kinds of labor engaged to produce those specific kinds of uh, qualities associated with each of these commodities. So when we equate these different commodities having these different use values, okay, we not only abstract from the use value for the seller of the commodity, but we also abstract from the concrete labor that produces that particular use value. Hence, step three. We are left with only one thing then in considering these exchanges, which is, uh, let me put it together, abstracted concrete labor. Marx calls that, for short, abstract labor, and that's what's common to all the commodities. In, this, in, in capitalist society. So the reason, the answer, why one cloth, one, I'm sorry, one coat is equal to 20 yards of linen and so forth, is that both commodities have in common, a common subs substance, which is this kind of labor in general to produce that commodity, which Marx calls, for short, abstract labor. He measures that in time, so he argues that what, what all these commodities have in common is the socially necessary abstract labor time, socially necessary abstract labor time to produce a commodity. That's the missing property that he's come up with. He presents then an abstract labor theory of value, 
and just to you know, go back to that footnote again, that's to be compared and contrasted with a, uh, a non-Marxian neoclassical economic theory, which confronts this, these same equations. And that non-Marxian theory comes up with, if you have studied this or you will study this, a utility theory of value. And so you have an abstract labor theory of value versus a utility theory of value. And we can go back to the first part of this course and ask that interesting epistemological question of which one of them is right. And remember what we did. You can't answer that question. You have two different theories of value with the two different consequences on our lives. Okay. Let me give you, the, finally to wrap this up, let me give you the uh, uh, example, um, staying with Coates and Lennon here. So let me get rid of uh, these two equations, uh, if I may, and let's go back. We have this labor process that we've talked about in the course, but I'm going to change it. If you remember, this is the labor taking place times its productivity gives its wealth. But I'm going to change the L now. This is going to be, because we just did it, abstract labor okay, to produce, um, in this case, the, uh, let me start with the coat. So, okay, and the productivity of this uh, abstract labor. Suppose it takes one hour of labor in general, so it takes an hour, that's the socially necessary abstract labor time, this is the assumption, it takes an hour to produce one coat. So let me write this carefully. It's trivial, but it's important to see it. One coat per one hour of abstract labor, then multiplying through, we have the result of one coat. Okay? By the same logic, we have the labor, the abstract labor, to produce, I'll use a different letter here, the, um, what was it, the linen. Okay. Suppose it takes up one hour of abstract labor, and one hour we get 20 yards of linen per that same abstract labor. Okay. Then that gives us the 20 yards of linen. So let's go back. What has Marx done here? When he examines, let me put it, let me put it over here. Is the, can, we, can we get that on the camera? Okay, good. So when he has um, one coat equals 20 yards of linen, let's take this, each of these, uh, let me get the same L here so I don't get you all fouled up. One coat equals 20 yards of linen. Let's take the perspective of the coat maker. The coat maker produces a coat. What is the cost of doing that in terms of labor? It takes one hour. Of what kind of hour? Abstract labor, labor in general, that which is common to everybody. Okay? So we're abstracting from the concrete labor. So we're just asking the question, how much labor does it take, on the average, social labor to produce a coat? It takes an hour. That's, that's what we just did. So the coat maker gets rid of that, it's getting rid of an hour. And what is he, she acquiring? 20 yards of linen, he asked the question. In Marxian terms, what is that worth? Well, that, that notion of worth is abstract labor. So you, the, 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 the seller of the coat is acquiring the linen, 20 yards, and that's worth, we just did it, one hour of the same kind of labor, labor in general, because that's what it took to produce 20 yards of linen, right over here. So. What Marx has done here is to establish an equivalence in the market. Very, very important. That is, and this goes for all commodities, what the seller sells is precisely equal to what he, she gets. So the coat maker gets, gets rid of an hour of labor, of his, her labor, and acquires an hour of labor from the other producer, in this case, linen. So, the market is a place, or sometimes Marx calls a, a, a sphere of equivalent exchange. That's what Marx it, he literally constructed this. No one gets cheated, no one gets exploited in capitalism in the exchange of commodities. That's so important, let me do it again. 
No one gets cheated. No one gets exploited in the exchange of commodities in capitalism. Everybody is treated fairly and justly in the market. Irrespective of what you may have heard, Marxism is not a theory that is going to argue that the market in capitalism is a place of exploitation. That's just wrong. What the market does is redistribute value from one party to the other in this equivalent way. So the, the conclusion of this is that exploitation, which we've talked about in this course, has to occur outside the market in a different sphere. So the market of, in, of commodities between buyers and sellers, that, that equivalent exchange becomes a condition of existence of a profound inequality and exploitation which is going to occur outside the market and for Marx, is going, as we're going to see very quickly, is going to occur in production. Let me do that again. This, the, 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 uh, the market is a place of equivalence, no cheating, which is going to become a condition of existence for a profound inequality and class exploitation that's going to occur outside the market in the sphere of exchange. Let me pause until the next lecture.